Well, it's 10, 11, and we're way shy of the number of people who were supposed to be here. But uh, forget them. We'll go ahead and start it up. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion on the sign up. Uh, if need be, you can give me the money. But the original intention was for the charity for people to go out and uh, donate via the PayPal link. If you go to Shook, wait a second. This is, there's nothing embarrassing in my history. <laughs> Shukon.org. There's actually a little donate link there, and we've been putting this class on for charity. We're just asking people to donate ten bucks uh, to it. Um, apparently, when the constant contact request went out, it said at the door, and um, I didn't know that. You can if you want to, but I prefer people to go out there and do it via PayPal. That way, I don't have to remember to take the money down to Atlanta when I see them. Um, but we'll go ahead and begin the class. My name is Aidan Crenshaw, of course, and today's topic is local password exploitation. A little bit about me, I run iongeek.com. Has anybody been to that website before? Yay! Hey, congrats, you got blocked at our um, corporate... I get blocked by a lot of people. <laughs> so, yeah. it, took you, it took you a couple of years, but you did it. Yes. <laughs> Apparently, I'm well enough known to be blocked, so I suppose I should take that as a, you know... <laughs> I complained, and they told me to get banned. Uh, well, yeah, I am. Alright, uh, I have an interest in InfoSec education. Uh, education. One of my big things is I like to go out and uh, teach people stuff. Uh, I don't know everything. I'm just a geek of time on my hands. There's probably some things you'll ask me that I just don't know. There's just some intricacies of uh, pass the hash and why it's harder to do it with Kerberos or NTLM version 2 that I don't know why you can't easily do it, though apparently, according to Ruben here, there is a way of now doing it with uh, Kerberos. And why it's easy to do with LM hashes or LM and just straight uh, NTLM. Uh, however, ask me, we can do some research and figure some things out. Also, I'm a regular on the ISD podcast. The, this charity event is being held for uh, the Matthew Shoemaker Memorial Care Fund, and Matthew was one of my fellow podcasters on that particular podcast. All right, a little bit about what I plan to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about pulling passwords from web browsers, IAM clients, and other applications, as well as Windows itself. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about a hash cracking of Windows passwords as well as other systems, maybe a little bit on Linux. I'm going to let um, Martin and Alex take care of that. Martin and Alex uh, are actually Louisville local boys. Uh, they run a Question Defense um, website where you can actually submit hashes to get cracked, and they were also on the winning team from this year's uh, DEF CON's, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the contest, but essentially it was a like hash crack cracking contest. And the team that won was called a Team Hashcat, and they were on that team. So they should be very well qualified to speak on the subject of uh, hash cracking. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of work with uh, sniffing plain text passwords off the network. And uh, also, uh, how you can use passwords on one box to uh, worm your way to other hosts on the network. And if nothing else, I hope it gets you thinking. Uh, I have a philosophy that exploits are temporary, but bad design decisions are forever. For instance, individual ways where passwords are stored in the registry or on the file system, when they realize how dumb it was to put it there, they may be able to change that. But some people in the future, and while that particular vector, like I'm going to show you how to uh, find the VNC password on a box. Well, someone may fix that in the future, but you know someone else in some future application is going to be making the exact same mistake somewhere down the line, which is why I say exploits are temporary, and uh, bad design decisions are forever. Okay, the question might come up, why exploit local passwords? Aren't we more interested in like getting root or administrative privileges on a domain? Well, there's several different reasons why a tackle might want to look at local passwords. First of all, you may want to escalate privileges on the local host. For instance, you have physical access to a box. Let's say you're in an open uh, environment. Um, Let's say a campus environment. By the way, anybody who knows me from a, a different job, if you try any of this at uh, that different job, uh, a guy who looks like a very angry Charlie Brown will come up and bust your kneecaps, so don't. Are we understood? Do this only in your own home lab. I have some odd friends. He does look like Charlie Brown. <laughs> he wants me to say a pissed off looking ball guy, but uh, he looks like Charlie Brown. <laughs> All right. But there's reasons why people might want to escalate local privileges. One, they just might want to install games and whatnot, but from a security standpoint, they get access to one local box, 
and let's say it's a secretary's machine or whatnot, they install a couple of password catches, then it can get domain privileges. And also, I'm showing a little bit about uh, cracking uh, cached domain credentials. Anybody ever notice how when you log into a Windows box and all of a sudden you lose access to the domain controller, you can still log in? That's because it caches your credentials on the system. Now, those are a little bit harder to crack than straight LM hashes or NTLM hashes, but it can be done. Uh, at least on XP. I'm having some problems on Windows 7. We'll get to that details later. So there's reasons why people want local passwords because they can help them get network passwords. Also, let's face facts. A lot of people reuse the exact same passwords all over the place. So if depending on how good the administrators are, the local admin password might be the same thing as the domain password. And a lot of people are going to use the same admin administrator password on the Windows box as they do for the root password on the Linux box. It's just human nature to uh, reuse. I was going to say, uh, a lot of the corporations are using single sign-on systems, and so you don't really have any choice. Your password it's is, all the same it is what it is because it's going out to the whatever server, or whatever. Also, you can look for like similar themes. Like If you find someone's password is uh, Star Trek related on one box, it gives you a quick idea on what kind of password list to build for cracking other boxes in those system. Pe human beings are relatively predictable. Also, just for the fun of doing it. That's another excellent reason for doing a lot of things. All right, part of the subject is it's so wide. People have asked me, are you going to be covering this? Are you going to be covering that? And there's a lot of things to talk about in this particular subject. Uh, password exploitation is such a huge topic that there's no way I can cover it in depth, even in the amount of time I have. Not to mention, um, prep time would be tremendous. You could probably do a semester-long course on this. But there's a bunch of little bits of background information I want to give everybody so that they're ready for uh, later parts of this class. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about a scenario why local passwords matter. Let's say an attacker grabs a, a local password on one box. Well, a lot of people use image systems where they use Ghost or some other imaging program to roll out the exact same image on a bunch of machines. So now that you have the local password on that one machine, you could use that across the network to install stuff, let's say use PS Execute um, from system tunnels, to install stuff on other systems out there on the network. From there, you might be able to install keyloggers, sniffers, and other things, get other domain credentials, and go find even more boxes on the network. It's all about getting that first level and making a niche for yourself and then increasing access. A little bit of methodology of how I'm going to uh, do this class, hopefully. Uh, my target audience are going to be uh, workstation installers, system administrators, and security folks, and uh, general gearheads like myself. I'm going to go into some little technical stuff, but I think most of it should be easy to follow, at least I hope. Um, the presentation format, I'm going to explain the background of a particular exploit or a particular problem, show the exploit, and if there's something specific, I'm going to point the audience towards our countermeasures. Sometimes it's not specific ones. For instance, a lot of password things, only thing I can say is choose better passwords, do complete hard drive encryption, uh, don't write it down in a place where everybody can find it. A lot of people say don't ever write your passwords down. Well, I'd rather people write the password down and keep it in their wallet than, um, than use a really weak password and keep it only in their head. Now, someone said, a friend of mine, we were having a debate about... Um, whether or not someone who recently got caught in spying, whether or not they were really dumb for keeping their password in their wallet. Well, generally a password in your wallet is pretty safe for most people until you get nabbed by the FBI. Not that I'm saying anybody here should be worried about nabbed by the FBI, because I don't want to support those kind of people. By the way, I'd like you all to welcome Martin and Alex. These are two of the guys from Team Hashcrack, and also uh, they run Question Defense, and they're going to be doing a section on... Uh, well, more in-depth stuff on hash cracking and showing off the hash cat, cat tool, which I've only played with a little bit so far, but it's freaking fast. I'll say that for it. That's documentation, though. Get with me. I'm going to work on that. And I need to talk to Adam. Adam's the guy who created uh, or is the core developer on Hashcat. Is that correct? Yes. I, I got some stuff for him. If he needs help uh, on systems, I got some uh, sample files to send him. All right. Glossary. In font that you're never going to be able to read. By the way, these slides will be up on my website before long. If anybody wants them, like during a break or something, or after class, just let me know. But I want to put this stuff out there so that people could um, have the background information. All right, first of all, cracking a password. This is essentially what I mean by that is deobfuscating a password's representation. 
a lot of times the, a password is not stored as an actual password on a system. It's hashed, and I'll go into that in a bit, uh, so that if someone looks at the system, they don't actually get the original password back. They get the hash of it. A brute force attack is essentially choosing uh, all possible characters for a combination, uh, all possible characters uh, that a password has. Like if you know someone's passwords are eight characters long, all alphanumerical, you could increment through every single possible combination. That would be brute force. And um, if you get to a certain length, that becomes basically impossible. Uh, you know, it, each time you add an extra character, let's say they're just typing in all uh, alphabetical or uh, lower case, you basically increase the problem set by 26 for each character you add, 26 times the previous complexity. You add that out a little bit, you get to a passphrase, it gets pretty much impossible to do a brute force attack. Dictionary attacks, however, <laughs> A little bit easier because you can predict what a person might use. Uh, but for people who choose really simple passwords, uh, brute force attacks are an option. And for some really weak hashing algorithms like LM hashes, that's also a possibility. We'll, we'll cover that much later on as well. Uh, dictionary attack is basically throwing a word list at something uh, just to see if anybody chooses any common things. Um, hybrid attack would be a combination of brute force and dictionary attacks where you take stuff and mangle it. Like uh, maybe uh, take a dictionary and then replace all the A's of at symbols when you tr and try those as well. Uh, as far as mangling um, word lists and so forth, the guys in question defense are going to cover that in much more depth than I intend to. Uh, hashing is essentially applying a mathematical uh, formula to a piece of text to get a shorter <laughs> number of string. And I'm going to give some examples of that. Uh, a few common ones would be like MD4, MD5, SHA1, SHA2, and so forth. A uh, one-way hash is simply, essentially something that when you make the hash of it, it's not easy to reverse. Uh, it's something that's one way, as opposed to like normal encryption where the idea is eventually to get a string back of what the plain text was. Plain text, of course, is the unobfuscated or unencrypted form of a string, the opposite of ciphertext. Now, password hash, I've already covered a hash with. It's basically how you store it. Reversible encryption is the opposite of a hash of, of, of uh, you know, of a one-way hash, you can basically reverse it. For instance, Rock 13. Is anybody familiar with uh, Rock 13? Mm. Uh, Rock 13 is essentially uh, you increment everything by all characters in the set by 13, and then to unencrypt it, you wrote him by 13 again, and you get back to the original plain text. By the way, this entire presentation is uh, encrypted Rock 26, or double XOR if you prefer. Joke with the crypto news. Um, <laughs> Uh, and finally, assault is an extra little seed for hashing that adds complexity and makes it harder to do what's known as pre-computation attacks, which we will be covering much later on. A few examples of uh, hashes. Now, these, these are generated using um, Kane. When you install and run Kane, you actually see you can type in any old uh, word and it will show you what the uh, hash representation for it would be. And here's a bunch of common ones. You see MD5 up there, SHA1, SHA2. Different hashes are considered more secure than others. You can see uh, NTLM, uh, oh, sorry, NT and LM hashes up there as well. LM hash is incredibly weak, which I will go to much later in the class. But here's a few examples of what I mean by a hash. Basically, they take the string and they return a fixed length numerical value, which is what we have there. Uh, a guy online, Aircon, he's a uh, regular on the Paul.com forums. Uh, he suggested I show everybody, or he suggested I go take a look at this webpage on insiderpro.com. Uh, neat thing about this is you can enter any hash, and it even does domain crash credentials hash. So let's say I put in bad password. And I happen to know domain uh, credentials. They use a hash that is actually salted with the username. So let's say the username was some user. I'm actually I'm going to put that in both spots because I'm not sure which one this particular form takes. I can say generate, and it gives me the hash representation of that. Now, the time this might be useful is if you found uh, where a particular application was writing its password, but you had no idea how it was obfuscating it. You could possibly go look at something like this and say, you know what, this hash it stored looks like this one, so I'm betting this is the algorithm. It might be something useful for you. Also, I've had good luck with just going to Google and searching for a hash and finding it. 
قسم 